social media platforms, Facebook, and on YouTube as well. To all our audiences, we are grateful that you have also joined us from wherever you are. And when the time is up, we will invite you also to participate in the program. And subsequently, we will tell you how to do so. But please stick and stay with us throughout the very short ceremony, uh, which is the launch of Working with Rawlings, a book authored by Professor Kwamena Ahoy. As it is our tradition here in Ghana, and particularly with the Ahoy family, whenever they have any program, they invite the presence of God. And we have the very right person to do that for us, Mrs. Comfort Ahoy will give us the opening prayer. Please, let's acknowledge her with a round of applause. Shall we bow down in prayer, prayer? Our Heavenly Father, the Almighty and Everlasting God, the creator and the sustainer of life, the giver who watches over us and protects us. We come before your presence today and we humbly invite your presence at our gathering as we undertake this program to launch this book. Lord God Almighty, we pray that you preside over this program take total and absolute control, steer and direct it and bring it all to a successful conclusion. And Father, at the end of it all, the thanks and the glory will go to you. All these and more have we prayed in Jesus' mighty name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. I think my sister Hoy deserves a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, let's do it. We are here to celebrate, and the celebration comes with applause, the applauding. Uh, these are times we cannot shake hands or hug each other, and so the best we can do to acknowledge each other is to give some applause. Um, let, let's do it, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have the honor of introducing the chairman for this occasion. The chairperson is somebody who needs no introduction. And usually in Ghana, when we say that somebody doesn't need any introduction, what it means is that the person is so well known because of their very long CV, and that if you mean to go through their CV, it will take us the entire ceremony period to introduce that kind of person. So I'll cut it short. Uh, recently, not too long ago, our chairperson was a minister of state she was the minister in charge of fisheries and aquaculture. Now at the time, what I recall, and the funny incident happened in my newsroom, a young lady had come to do her internship. And she did a story that our chairperson was involved in. Our chairperson gave a speech, and this person, the young lady who was on internship, came back and wrote a very beautiful story. But for TV, the story doesn't end on paper. You have to read the script to be recorded. She had written the name Honorable Sherry Ayite. Yet when she was reading out the script 
before recording, she said, Honorable, and apparently she had a problem with the R and L. So she said, Honorable Shelley Aite. I was the, her editor. So I said, No, the name is not Shelley, it is Sherry. They said, Sir, I didn't get it wrong. It is Shelley. It is here, written on the paper, Shelley. And I said, <laughs> so she had a problem with her R and her L. It took me time to get acquainted with the fact that she just couldn't mention Madame Sherry Aite's name. Um, that is our chairperson. For many years, she was and is still at the peak of political affairs here in this country, uh, dating back to the days of the PNDC, NDC1, NDC2, and the coming back of NDC again, she has been in the thick of affairs and she's the very right person to chair this occasion for us because the issues contained in this book very much have to do with things that she also knows a lot about. Let's give a round of applause as we welcome our chairperson, <laughs> Madam Sherry Aite. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, distinguished uh, invited guests, and uh, our professor, uh, Professor Kwamina Hoy. I'd like to thank you for asking me to chair this program. And uh, because uh, we are limited with time, I'll just give a brief introduction. For me, this book is about the path of destiny. It is about the lives of two people living in a different world. But somehow, an event brought them together. Kwamna was so disillusioned that he was trying to pack his bag and luggage to go and take a job in Zambia. But somehow, Something happened, an intervening force, and the intervention was by Professor Adai Mensa, who recommended Kwamna to GBC to organize an interview. Kwamna did so well after he had returned from Oxford. The interview was very powerful, not knowing that somebody was also watching and listening to the interview. And this person also lived in a different world. After the interview, Kwamna was invited during June 4th to interview the former president, Jerry John Rawlings. And I think that uh, he was so touched by the brilliance of Kwamna. So at the interview, Kwamna was able to impress him so much that uh, 31st December revolution, Kwamna had his name on radio, being invited to Gunda Barracks. And I'm sure that uh, the wife who was then the research assistant at that time must have been very, very, very worried. But that invitation to Gunda Barracks brought the two together. And from there, I'm sure that uh, we are going to hear the excerpts of how the path of two people in the political history of Ghana came together and brought changes to the people of this country. Sit and enjoy. Thank you. Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. Usually when I moderate events like this, I would find just about two or three high profile people. And so it's easy to say, let us introduce some of the dignitaries we have here. But looking around, I find many people here, in fact, almost everybody here is a dignitary. And so attempting to introduce people here might take us the whole day. And I will not attempt to do that, but to say we are thankful to you for coming. I find former ministers of states, former CEOs, in fact, people who have occupied very important positions in this country here this afternoon, and we are grateful that you have come. Uh, but let me introduce to you those who are seated 
on the high table. Of course, our chairperson has just welcomed us and accepted the seat. So I'll introduce the man seated to, the extreme, to my extreme left and to your right. He is Nana Kwesijan Apintin. Not too long ago, Nana Kwesijan Apintin was the chairman of Ghana's National Media Commission. He is an astute writer who has for so many years been writing for the Daily Graphic as well as the Mirror. Nana is also a, a chief, the Apijahene of Achim Ati. Let's give Nana a big round of applause. <laughs> Nana, you cut me short. There's something else I wanted to say. It's one of your secrets. I'll keep it for now. Thank you. Then the man in white is the reason we are all here. I'll simply say he's someone who worked with Rawlins, and his name is Professor Kwamena Ahoy. Um, I just realized when Honorable Sherry Aite was talking about him, she kept saying Kwamena. And for people of my generation, that is so weird because we haven't heard the name Kwamena come without the prof preceding it. So it was like you were talking about a different person. I had to retune myself to believe that you were actually talking about our professor, the man who is always in a hat. Let's give him a round of applause. He's the reason we are here. But let's thank Wazor TV, who are helping us to do this. And they are also broadcasting it on Facebook and on YouTube. MyJoyOnline.com is also carrying this. TVXYZ is carrying this. City TV and Joy News TV, we are grateful to you for your partnership. At this point, I'll call on another man who worked with Rawlins, but this time he is with the CDT. CDT is Center for Democratic Transitions Ghana. Nana Atudazi is the executive director. He's also a former chief of staff. Nana, please address us. Thank you. I don't know what the protocol is for reading, but uh, just permit me. Madam Chairperson, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Center for Democratic Transition, Ghana, CDT, is an independent, non political, non sectarian institution that taps on the experience of, the ex of its consultants to offer advisory services to sovereign states, international organizations, on political transitions from a constitutional rule to another, the transfer from a military government to a civilian constitutional rule, and advisory services on public sector reforms generally. CDT Ghana is into research, historical analysis, documentation on public education, with a view to progressively impact on the novel political trajectory of new emerging democratic states in Africa and elsewhere. Professor Kwamla Hoy, executive member's book, Working with Rawlings, documents his 19 years long public service experience as an aide and senior member, senior minister, working with chairman also President J.J. Rawlings in the Republic of Ghana. A rich state of poli practical and political experience at various ministerial positions. Professor Kwam Nahoy, his book offers deep knowledge of public service in Ghana and elsewhere. Obviously, provocative and published within the era of living participants and witnesses this book is set to trigger a huge debate and controversy. No doubt about that. Yesterday, I saw the first shot on um, Gala Web. The knowledge discharged, however, is bound to positively impact on public sector governance. And in practice, 
the world of political transitions, both for students and practitioners. CDT Ghana is obviously delighted in collaborating with one of our distinguished founding executive members, Professor Kwame Lahoy, to produce and outdoor his seminar work on working with royals. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let permit me to commend uh, Digibooks, Ghana Limited, for their uh, hard work on this. Ladies and gentlemen, please permit me on behalf of CDT to welcome all of you to this afternoon's book lunch. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, Nana Atudazi, Executive Director of CDT Ghana. We'll now take a statement from Mr. Fred Labi, CEO, Digibooks Ghana Limited, the publishers of the book we are here to launch. Where's Mr. Fred Labi? Yeah. All right, Mr. Fred. Chairperson, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a privilege to be able to present Digibooks as the publishers of this great historical book, Working with Rollins by Professor Kwame Ahoy. I would like to thank Kwame who happens to be my secondary school mate in the 60s, for giving Digibooks the opportunity to publish this great book. It has been a pleasure working with you, Prof, through the conception, birth, and now the adoring of this very well-researched historical book. We have much enjoyed your dedication to excellence and attention to detail through the whole period we work together. We hope that our partnership shall continue well into the future where we shall do more books. I would also like to thank my wife and the team from Digibooks for all the hard work and dedication to ensuring that this publication is such a great success. I have only one key message to give tonight. Africa is suffering from a significant literary deficit. There are not enough African writers. This poses a significant threat to the preservation of our culture and learning from past mistakes. To quote from Machina TV, until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunter will always glorify the hunter. The world is ignorant of Africa, and it is our responsibility to enlighten them by contributing our perspective not only in areas of dominant academic discourse, but also depicting our attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, and thus leave a true legacy for our children. Marcus Gavi, the Jamaican publisher and the political activist for black nationalism, once said, to quote, a people without knowledge of their past, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots, unquote. And further to quote Winston Churchill, a nation that forgets its past has no future, unquote. These quotes emphasize the benefits of past knowledge on the present and future. The past present mistakes from which people can learn to avoid repeating them. It is therefore very important to chronicle our history to progress our nation. That is what this book, Working with Rawlings, is actually doing. May I take this opportunity to encourage our diplomats, politicians, entrepreneurs, and all people of all walks of life to write their contribution to the nation building. We at Digibooks are specialists in print-on-demand publishing. We are dedicated to supporting authors through the life cycle of book development, from conception, editing, book design, launch, and distribution. We have the unique capability to develop a prototype of your actual publication and work with you, the author, a flexible and affordable final book printed at a large scale. 
Other titles we've published include various memoirs, academic journals, biographies, and autobiographies. We are currently the largest publisher for the University of Ghana Ligon Reader Series. Digibooks would like to be your publisher of choice. And we are dedicated to continue driving similar contributions to Ghana and Africa's literary wealth. If you have an unpublished book ready to be published, we will be happy to collaborate with you to turn a dream into a reality. Broad book launch today will be available in all bookshops in the country and also on the publisher's website. They are planned to sell it on Amazon and other internet sites. There's also a plan to do an e-book version to capture the iPad and Kindle markets. Finally, thank you all for taking time off your busy schedule to come physically or watch online to support the adoring of this must read historical book, Working with Lawrence. Do not live without grabbing a book for yourselves and friends and those watching virtually. Please use the phone numbers provided and publisher website to purchase your copies. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take a little break here and uh, enjoy a separate work performance, and this performance will be done by Mr. Osei Kranchi of the University of Ghana, Legon. Some 
Let's let's do this, please. Um, no, no, wait for me, wait for me, please. Um, just show me your right arms. Let, let me see your right arms. Um, can I see your left as well? Let's wave them around. On the count of one, I want us to simultaneously put them together. Let's see if we can do this at the same time. So, on the count of one, are we ready? One. Oh, that, that was good. No, but somebody was late. Let's try it one more time, please. Are we ready? One. Okay, can we do it three times, please? When I say go, wait, when I say go, then we do. Okay, so let's start. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go. Okay, so I know you were all in class one at a point in time. This is what we call clapping. Now clap for the Seprewa performer. Clap for him. Aha. <laughs> and now I want you to clap again because I invite now the author himself. Professor Kwamena Ahoy to give us a reading of selected excerpts from the book that he himself has written. Now let's do it for him. Thank you very much. Good evening, my brothers and sisters, and uh, welcome to the show. Now, because the book is going to be reviewed, I have selected only two excerpts you know, to read for you. The first is entitled Ghana versus the USA in International Espionage, the Susudis Affair. In 1985, Ronald Reagan was president of the USA and Jerry John Rawlings was the chairman of the PNDC and head of state of the Republic of Ghana. It was under their watch that one of the most audacious and dramatic incidents of international espionage involving the exchange of USA Ghanaian assets, that is the US euphemism for their spies, for another Ghanaian citizen occurred. Michael Agbuti Susudis was a cousin of Jerry John Rawlings and a vital source of sensitive and delicate information for Ghana's national security apparatus. He entered into a romantic dalliance with a young lady operations support assistant, the Americans refer preferred to describe her as a clerk, of the US CIA station in Accra. Her name was Susan Skernage. Over time, Ms. Skernage made over to Mr. Susudis CIA classified information, including the identities of the CIA agents or assets or spies in Ghana, 
and in other West African countries. That list, according to the Americans, was made over to Captain Kujo Chikata, then in charge of national security under the PNDC. The US allegation was that Captain Chikata shared this information with the intelligence agencies of Cuba, Libya, the former East Germany, and other pro-Soviet Union nations. Some of the assets in Ghana were arrested, investigated, and handed over to me as a coordinator of the public tribunals to process them for trial before the public tribunals. Three of them were convicted of spying and sentenced by the public tribunals. The CIA feared that this was the beginning of more to come, that the spy network in West Africa had not only been compromised, but was about to be dismantled, and that their assets in Ghana faced the risk of execution, since the offenses under which they were being tried carried the death penalty. They panicked. They investigated and zeroed in on Ms. Hennig as a likely source of the leakage. She was recalled to Washington, D.C., for consultations, where she was handed over to the FBI for interrogation. She confessed her deeds, was tried, convicted, and sentenced to five years' imprisonment, later reduced to two years. The FBI then decided to use her to entrap Susudis. Ms. Scarnage was made to extend an innocent invitation to her lover, Michael Susudis to visit her in the USA for them to embark on an idyllic vacation. It is important to know that Michael Susidis had all along been a legal permanent resident of the USA. On his arrival in the USA, Susidis was arrested and put on trial for engaging in espionage activities against the USA. The Americans then sent a signal to Accra that they were prepared to negotiate an exchange between Michael Susudis and their Ghanaian assets. The government agreed in principle to the negotiated exchange in a return signal to them. The negotiations began in a very bizarre fashion. The CIA sent down to us, through the US Embassy in Accra, a list of almost 100 Ghanaians, including the names of some very prominent citizens, all of whom they claimed were their assets. They wanted to take out all these persons, as well as their spouses, their children, and their parents. The Americans provided their full details, including their addresses, their schools, in the case of the children, their workplaces, and various other particulars. They wanted to take these assets and their relations away to the USA by landing a C-130 military transport plane at the Tamale airport to evacuate all of them in one flight. In all, about 400 Ghanaians were to be evacuated in the exercise. Ghana's counterintelligence unit went to work. They advised us to reject the proposal on three main grounds. One, the list clearly contained names of persons who could not possibly be CIA assets and was intended to destabilize Ghana's intelligence architecture. Two, the so-called assets acted as individuals. Their sins could not therefore be extended to their spouses, their children, and their parents. Three, the use of a C-130 military transport plane posed a grave security risk to Ghana. What if 500 U.S. Marines popped out of the plane and launched an attack on the country? We went back to the drawing board. The Americans took back the list and reduced the number of the so-called assets to about 50. They also dropped the demand for their spouses, their children, and parents to be evacuated alongside them. It was then decided that I should interview each of the persons on the new list and make a determination as to whether, in my view, the person was a CIA asset or not. The persons were also to indicate their willingness to be voluntarily repatriated to the USA in exchange for Michael Susudis. At the end of my interviews with the persons on the list, only eight of them accepted to leave for the USA under the arrangement, implicitly admitting that they were indeed CIA assets or spies. So it came to pass that on the appointed day, the eight self-confessed US CIA assets were driven in a convoy of about 20 vehicles 
led by the IGP and police dispatch riders from the police CID headquarters to the Lumi International Airport in Togo, where the rest of the heads of agreement were implemented to the letter. I was at the CID headquarters to make sure that everything went according to plan, but did not travel with them to Togo. I have left out a lot of the details because I want you to buy the book and read it for yourself. The second excerpt is titled Officer of the Volta, Ovi. By the end of President Rollins' first term of office on 6th January 1997, I had decided to leave frontline politics and not to continue in office as minister in his second term as president. I had communicated my decision to both President Rollins and Captain Kojo Chikata, and neither of them had objected to my decision. Not too long after Rollins' inauguration as the President of the Second Government of the Fourth Republic on 7th January 1997, but before he began the nomination of his ministers, I received a telephone call from Captain Chikata. He asked me to submit my curriculum, my CV, to the State Protocol Division because President Rollins had decided to bestow a state honor on me. I was ecstatic and extremely appreciative because I believed this was Jerry's way of bidding farewell to me as I exited his government. I duly complied and submitted my CV. On the appointed day, bedecked in my colorful Kedinte cloth, in which I must admit I felt very uncomfortable, as I was not used to wearing cloth, and accompanied by my wife, Comfort, and my siblings, I reported at the venue for the event at the frontage of Parliament House. When it got my turn to be presented with a medal of the officer of the Volta and the scroll of honor, President Rollins held on to me for an unusually long time. What people did not realize was that he was talking to me. I still remember his words as if it were yesterday. Munia, he said, we started this journey together. Don't abandon me in the middle of the journey. Let us finish the journey together. In the euphoria of the moment, and given, that, and given the solemnity of the occasion, what else could I say but mumble, yes, sir? <laughs> With that, I was locked into Rollins' second government of the Fourth Republic, and I had become the proud recipient of the state honor of the officer of the Volta. Thank you very much. Another applause for the recipients of the order of the Volta. Professor Kwamena Ahoy. Um, I find a little positive discrimination going on here. That the author is an old student of Okiapeman Secondary School. The publisher who spoke to us not long ago is an old student of Okiapeman Secondary School. Then the man I'm about to call to review the book for us is an old student of Okiapeman Secondary School. <laughs> the gentlemen who are here who didn't go to Okiapeman, please let's walk out in protest. <laughs> let's welcome Nana Kwesijan Appenton, ex-chairman NMC, ex-president Go, and chairman of steering committee Power to review the book for us. Please let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, normally, you have to greet a few people, but thankfully I can't see anybody's face. So that's my excuse for going straight, except Madam Chair and the man of the moment, the author. Um, I'm a little nervous because I've been involved in many book launches and done a few reviews. But this is one of the few when the review will never be as good as the book. Take that from me. So probably the best thing is to say, buy the book and let's get out of here. <laughs> Work done. As you heard, the author of this book, and I went to the same school. He was my junior by one year. And I met him the first day he was brought to school. 
his mother left him or was about to leave him and he was either crying or about to cry. <laughs> so I was invited to console him because previous, the previous year I had been at almost as tiny as he had been. He was one of the smallest boys ever to come to Kwakman School. All his papa these days notwithstanding. <laughs> so I went to him and I had a piece of chocolate and I shared it with him. That stopped him from crying. So everything he's done in this world is down to that chocolate that I gave him 56 years ago. Fast forward about a few years later when we met as vandals. I reminded him and he pretended not to remember the chocolate. I assure you it, was, it is true. I gave him that chocolate. Today he has rewarded me for that chocolate to the privilege to review this important book. And I consider it a privilege and an honor to do this business here today. Indeed, I consider today to be historic in publishing terms in this country, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I say it's unfortunate that COVID-19 has robbed us of the huge numbers that could gather to witness this day. But thankfully, hopefully many, many more are with us in the, in the digital spiritual world. This book is very important, even without opening it for a reason. I wrote about it in my column last week and I said, I reminded my readers that one of the first articles I wrote about 15 years ago when I resumed writing that column in the mirror was titled, Rollings Must Write. Of course, before then and after that, many people have called on the former head of state to write. And the reason is that despite the boisterousness of that period, especially the early days, still that period remains opaque. We do not really have an insight into what went on. And uh, of course, it's a controversial period. So up to today, you have those against those four, but very little facts to go on. And so this has given rise to all kinds of theories and rumors about power struggles, personality clashes, policy challenges, etc. So I think the most important fact about this book is that it throws light on the inner workings of the Rollins years. It is true the author says in the book, this is not a book about Rollins, it's not a book about me, it's not a biography, etc. But indeed, it does more than that. I think that it illuminates that period like no other book has done before. I'm happy Kwamna uh, himself has read those interesting passages. I had all of them, but this morning, the publisher called and reminded me that I have only 10 minutes. And so I had to take those out. I'm very happy that he's read them. It's, it's a marvelous book, and I just want to concentrate on three areas that I have, have selected as the areas that I think, among the many, are important to track when you are reading. The first is the role played by the author himself and many of his colleagues. In giving shape to a revolutionary period that began without a roadmap. This book is, is probably the first to give us details about how those committees, older people here would remember the alphabet soup of committees, many of them. And from the outside, it looked like they were just throwing things about trying to shape a period to give it some semblance of order. But you read this book and see that indeed there was method, there was reason. And, and much of it that surprises me is that there was nothing arbitrary about it. I think that's a very important point to note. You should remember that Ghana had been destabilized, in effect, from 1966 when Nkrumah was overthrown. 